Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Club Metaverse podcast. I am here with Dr. Brian Keaton of the University of California, San Diego, astrophysicist, author. Um, how are you today, sir? I am great. How are you doing? I'm, I'm good, man. I'm good. I, I'm really excited to talk to you because uh, I'm, a, I'm kind of like an amateur, uh, you know, science enthusiast. You know, I, I've been very lucky. I've done documentaries with Brian Green and and you know Bill Nye, the Science Guy, and 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 Sean Carroll, you know. So I, I'm I'm actually very well versed in all things physics. But you know, today I thought maybe I'd try something a little bit different with you know with my usual kind of chats that I have with my guests, and maybe try to bring you into my world a little bit and see if I you know how some of your brain power can you know illuminate the kind of stuff that I'm involved with, which is you know mm. part of the you know the whole pop culture thing and. And and basically, because look, I have so much physics stuff that I can get into and so to totally nerd out with you on, and yeah. my own theories about where the Big Bang comes from, and you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but what I would love to ask you is, have you heard about this concept of the metaverse, and how would you define the concept of the metaverse? Yeah, I have heard about it. In fact, uh, later this week, I'm interviewing a uh, renowned <clears throat> philosopher at uh, New York University named David Char Chalmers, who has a new book called Reality Plus, in which he talks about the uh, restriction or the uh, notion that we are living in a simulated universe already. Mm. So that builds upon, you know, the concept of the metaverse and just extrapolates it uh, to the nth degree. But what's so infatuating, you know, about this idea is that he's claiming that we are in a simulation already. In other words, it's not a hypothesis, it's fact. Right. And so I'm approaching it from a physics perspective uh, and he's approaching it from a philosophical perspective and we're coming to radically different conclusions. And so uh, I'm gonna be really uh, pressing him hard on my podcast, which is Into the Impossible, <laughs> Dr. Brian Keating on YouTube. Yep. Uh, and what I'm trying to do is elucidate you know, where we agree, where we disagree, but you know, my fundamental contention, this might be too controversial for, for, the, for people to handle, is that all these notions of the metaverse and the simulated universe that we inhabit are first of all, indistinguishable from aliens mm -hmm. uh, or that some supernatural uh, you know, beings can control us, can establish a digital playground for our minds that uh, eliminates the need for a body, but also from God, Mark. So mm. if you want to talk about that, I'm happy to talk to you. Oh, 1,000%. Uh, and, and, yeah. and I, I, I think you and I are actually quite similar in our um, kind of relationship with faith. You know, like um, you mentioned something in an interview once um, that you're that uh, God, I forget the exact term, but you used uh, something agnostic, like an ardent agnostic or, or there, there was a very interesting term that you used. Um, which, which, yeah. which is that you're a practicing um, Catholic in, in terms of your morality and your ethics and your kind of relationship with yourself and with your family and the people around you, but that there are questions of science and physics that are in potential, maybe not conflict, but that are not yet resolved with the, w with the big picture. And I actually feel very similarly to that, you know, um, because I was raised Catholic. Um, I, I pray, you know, I, but then again, I also understand that, you know, 10% of the atoms in my body literally are hydrogen atoms that are 15, you know, potentially 14 billion years old, you know, so that, you know, how, how do you, how do you put those two things together, you know? Um, and um, yeah, so anyway, I would love to get into that kind of stuff, but I do want to ask you one thing about this concept of the simulation, because of course I've heard that. And the only way you can get me there is that it is possible that one day we will live in a simulation that's indistinguishable from reality. But the whole Pirandello uh, play within a play that we're living in a simulation and we're trying to invent simulations and then one day we'll invent the simulation that we live in, that, that's a little too too far down the rabbit hole for me. Do, yeah. do you have any inclination of why this person believes this to be a, a, you know, a measurable reality? Yeah, I think what uh, he does, obviously he can't, he can't point to any um, 
you know, evidence, hard evidence that there is a, you know, simulator or so forth. What fascinates me is that he kind of claims that it's more plausible than not to infer that we live in a universe. And he takes it back to the ancient philosophers, not the ancient philosophers, although he does describe that, but he takes it back to the Renaissance philosophers, in particular Descartes who was famous cogito ergo sum, which means I think therefore I am, sure. was his resolution to the problem of whether or not he was a brain in a jar uh, being fed stimuli from some external source. Sure. Now, what this guy Descartes, René Descartes, uh, conjectured was that in a universe with a god, a creator would not create a demonic situation in which there were beings that could think but were not existing. In the case of David Chal Chalmers, who's the author of Reality Plus, uh, which is the book that I'll be speaking to him about on Friday, mm -hmm. the concept of the simulated universe is a natural extension of what's called Moore's Law. In other words, we're already in a situation where we can simulate flights on computers, mm -hmm. we can simulate the weather, we can simulate e economic models, stock markets, we can simulate <clears throat> things that we never uh, had encountered what did Petra Jordan look like, uh, you know, uh, 2000 years ago. Uh, and we could simulate what an exoplanet atmosphere is comprised of and the life forms that exist within it. Mm. Uh, we can just keep going. The level of simulation has reached a point now where my colleagues at UC San Diego are simulating the entire universe, the construction of galaxies, matter, energy, mm -hmm. evolution, particles that we don't even know if it exists. And all this is being done on silicon computers. Sure. And that's being done uh, only 40 years, 50 years after the invention of what we'd consider the modern digital computer. Pace of change, it, uh, 50 years after Moore's Law was coined, the, uh, the conjecture, the proposition that computing power doubles every two years effectively. Mm -hmm. And its cost goes down, you know, by a factor of even more than two every two years. So this is incredible progress in a, a brief amount of time. And so the question arises, what will happen in the future? Well, we'll not only simulate, you know, the individual, um, you know, uh, planets and so forth, we'll simulate individual people mm -hmm. and we'll simulate what life would be like, a sort of massive version of SimCity uh, where you'll go back and at first you'll simulate the most interesting people. Mm -hmm. You'll go back and look at the physicists because we are the most interesting. No, no, you'll, you'll go back and look at, you know, the 12 centuries version of kim kardashian or you know you'll go back to jesus and you know i mean why learn physics from brian keating when you can go back and simulate this dude here albert einstein right right got a little right, right. holodeck here. holodeck style like like in Star yeah Trek. but, but yeah. like with all his words are, are already processed i'm simulating the works of galileo galilei why learn physics from the genius like me when you can right. learn a genius like albert einstein so the extrapolation of all these processes leads to this concept that it's a very near term when we can simulate every life that ever existed, namely the hundred billion. We think that there have been a hundred billion human lifetimes, li mm. lives uh, since the dawn of history when humans first emerged. So, uh, so that's incredible, right? Hundred billion, but it's it's a large number. It's roughly ten, you know, so it's fourteen times more than we have now, um, but. It's not that hard to think about simulating, going from simulating a million stars or a million galaxies to simulating a billion people in 2022, and then eventually 100 billion, no problem. So if we can do it now, the thinking goes, who's to say that someone isn't already doing that to us? And we are the Sims in the Sim universe that's being run for some purpose we know not what. Yeah, and... and I see that logic, but to me, there's something that's inescapable. Um, and there's a few things that are inescapable as far as my understanding goes. One of them is the arrow of time. And this is mm -hmm. a, a real thing. And that it takes time to evolve data sets, you know, for, you know, for simulation technology. I worked on, on Grand Theft Auto, um, right. you know, three Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Um, and you know, for us, even though this was already what this is already twenty years ago, almost. Yeah. Um, we exactly. had more a than challenge. To admit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We had a challenge of how do we simulate a pedestrian populace in the game that feels like they're alive to some degree, right? You know, and like, look, we had limited technology back then. The PS2 wasn't as powerful as the PS5 is now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, but we were we we actually took a page out of astrology, um, mm -hmm. you know, to create the data sets um, because astrology um, has this very, you know, interesting mechanism that depending, like all you need to know is the time of birth and the position on the planet 
where this person right. was born. <laughs> and you can extrapolate a character profile for them based out of all of this data set that's been collected over centuries by romantic authors and stuff. Correct. And we were able to use that to create attractions and um, and antagonizing behaviors between different groups and stuff. And it actually kind of started to work. So you can imagine that in the future, yes, I totally agree with you. We can create a simulation that's indistinguishable from reality. Is that what we're living in right now? I don't think so. Uh, you know, we're, you know, we're kind of far from that. Um, but I'm a huge VR guy and um, I'm also very much into VR video and hmm. I, I've been recording a lot of or experimenting with recording a lot of my uh, hours in VR video oh, wow. and, then, and then playing them back. And when you play it back, the feeling that you get is, is so strange because it's not like reading a book or, or, or an essay. You're reliving things again. And, you know, and anyway, there, there's, a, you know, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole, but. Yes, I, I personally don't think that there's enough empirical evidence, I guess, to support that this is currently a simulation. You know, I'm still trying to boggle, you know, like wrap my head around that we're actually living in a holographic universe and, and that we're really only projections coming from the edge of a black hole, you know, <laughs> which, which is. Yeah, and, and that is, of course, um, uh, you know, not really well accepted logic. I mean, that, that, that is kind of an interesting conjecture, even sure, though it's sure. uh, holographic universe uh, yeah. conjecture. But yeah. You know, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and there's so many different theories out there. The one, maybe we can go down this rabbit hole, but the one that I've been kind of um, losing myself in recently is the idea that the Big Bang was actually um, the other side of a black hole and that every single black hole creates Big Bangs in alternate spaces of, of reality and that's how all the different multiverses are actually kind of growing and expanding and bubbling up. Is there any kind of scientific data that, that you've heard that backs up or, or not that backs up, but that even dares to think of that as a theory? Yeah. I mean, the black holes are, are fascinating. Wormholes are fascinating in, in, uh, you know, in practice because we can't access them. So they're open to wild speculation. Um, and so you see movies like Interstellar and you see movies, you know, like the black hole and spider verse, uh, so forth, talking about the multiverse, <laughs> things that are inaccessible right. um, <clears throat> and how we can actually, uh, you know, resolve these things uh, really can only be approached by the human mind, mm -hmm. not by um, uh, uh, <clears throat> not by, you know, actual encountering with them because we wouldn't survive such an encounter. Sure. So it makes what we do extremely hard. You know, if you want to study chemical processes or biology or DNA or viruses, I don't know, can we say talk about viruses on the show? Right. Um, yes, you can. You can talk about anything you want, Dr. Peter. I don't want to get you demonetized. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. I had on some guests and, you know, they slapped on COVID warnings and they made it restricted in the comments. Oh, dude, no worries. No worries, man. This yeah, is yeah. like, this is all I about sharing Joe your Rogan knowledge. Level, yeah, <laughs> this is all about, re you know, sharing your knowledge with the world uh, or, or my limited little slice of it that is yeah so all these things are, are, are fascinating and yet we have no evidence for them so they only kind of exist in our mind and, and of course there's a lot of things that can be constructed in that we have no idea that they're actually you know electrons or little points yet we have a lot of evidence for that we, we don't see them in that way there's a limit to what you can actually see and so we typically talk about things that we can prove wrong in science not what we can prove right which is kind of you know, the opposite of what most normal think people think scientists do mm. uh, to the extent they even think about a scientist. Right. They, eliminate they the look possibilities. At a, what's that? I eliminate the variables, eliminate the possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of this, this principle of, you know, of reduction and Occam's razor. It's called, you know, you eliminate the more complicated uh, hypotheses and you, uh, and then what you're left with is likely to be more accurate, but actually right. we never get anything right. 100% confidence. In other words, if you ever hear a scientist state something, 100% they're not really practicing science because science is predicated on the assumption that the scientist is fallible mm -hmm. and not perfect, omniscient, omnipotent. And when we kind of supersede those bounds, I think we get into trouble and we do uh, damage to the reputation of science in the public sphere because if scientists will lie about certain things, you know, why should we trust them on other things? 
Um, so we want to look for evidence that supports a conclusion that's backed by some consensus. Uh, but we'll always have to recognize we can't know uh, an answer with perfect certainty. Like, for example, if you think the, uh, the earth is flat, mm -hmm. you're wrong. Uh, but also, if you think the earth is a perfect sphere, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Because it turns out when the earth spins around, it kind of bulges at the equator uh, because it has a very large spinning moment. So it's not a perfect crystalline sphere like this, sure. but it's certainly not flat like this. Uh, and so because of that, uh, you're actually wrong in both cases. But who's more wrong? The right. guy who says this is, this is true or the guy that says this is true. Right. Uh, and so you, we have evidence for hypotheses, but we'll never know it with precise uncertainty and zero uncertainty. And then you have the, you know, to add on top of that, then you have the issue of, of everyday experience and practicality. Because from a practical everyday experience, it's, it's far more useful intellectually to think of the earth as flat um, in terms of the distance that humans typically travel. That's right. right. Like you don't have to consider a curvature of the planet when you're walking, uh, you know, to buy some milk, you know, it, it, it's fairly flat. Um, so, yeah. So look, it, it, it's, um, it's, um, it's an interesting concept that I think uh, also one more thing that I wanted to, you know, uh, note onto the science stuff that I always kind of think about is that science is also this art form of, of predicting the future to the highest level of probability possible. Like, you know, to your yeah. point, it's not an absolute thing. It's just kind of like a trick to be able to predict what's going to happen in the future, you know, mm -hmm. and like, using your understanding of the science allows That's you right. to extrapolate what's going to happen. Um, you know, exactly. look at, and thank God for, for guys like, you know, um, Galileo and, and Newton for giving us those early nuggets of like, you can predict that this is going to happen if this happens, you know? Um, but yes, I, I, um, you know, scientists should be more willing to accept the data rather than their personal biases. I think mm -hmm. that that's the moral of the story. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, so going back to the black holes, cause I, cause um, there, there's, you know, you mentioned something that we can travel in there. We can't, um, you know, we can't really see what's going on, but for me, there's always been this kind of missing link that in my kind of romantic liter literative brain, I'm, I'm hoping can get us some answers, which is this, this deeper understanding of the graviton particle. And the importance of that has kind of changed over time. Um, back in the early 2000s, it was considered to be the most important thing ever. Then, you know, after the LIGO um, experiment yielded, the, you know, the gravitational waves, people kind of, I've heard physicists, even on this show, Dr. Avi Loeb, for example, tell me that uh, the, the, the detection of gravitational waves is essentially the same thing as discovering the graviton. But for me, to put the graviton in the standard model where all the other uh, particles that we have discovered exist seems like it still hasn't really been accomplished. I, like, am I wrong in, in understanding that? No, no, you're not wrong at all. And it's, uh, it's surprising that uh, you are choosing to go into the realm of quantum gravity, you know, as a, as a, as a bored ape. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's like, you know we're, we're just like hairless apes on a spinning blue marble. But I, I joked on Twitter the other day, I was like, do apes refer to themselves as, you know, hairy humans? I, I don't right. think so. so <laughs> there's some difference between humans and apes. Like as much as people want to, Oh, absolutely. Uh, we, absolutely. We want to actually compare us, you know, to animals yeah. and just say we're another animal. We're very much not an animal in, uh, in any true sense of the word. Anyway, agreed. your question is very, very uh, prominent. And I think if, uh, if Avi, you know, is being accurately quoted, I'm wondering if he meant something slightly different because. Which probably, he, he probably know, did. He probably did. Yeah. So, cause he would know that um, there's two different, regimes or, or, or what we call wavelengths in, in, in science and physics in particular, where you can speak about uh, the properties of a fundamental particle like the photon. The photon is a fundamental particle, which means mm -hmm. you can't decompose it into something else. You can't smash it apart. We can smash apart um, atoms into, you know, into protons and neutrons, mm -hmm. and we can smash apart those protons and neutrons into quarks and gluons. Uh, but we can't smash apart the gluons. We can't smash apart the uh, we can't smash apart the photons or the electrons. That's what it means to be elementary, indivisible. 
-hmm. which is what Adam meant uh, in Greek, but it's not actually true that it's indivisible. It's actually divisible. Anyway, in light, you have two different regimes, the so-called quantum regime, where light is called a photon. And then you have a, uh, you have a classical limit where it's considered a wave. Mm -hmm. So in gravitational physics, you have the same thing. The graviton is the heretofore undetected particle of gravity that is hypothesized to kind of play the role of mediating and causing the gravitational force fields to be manifest. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we have no evidence for that, and we have no consistent field theory that allows you to describe gravity at the quantum mechanical elementary particle level. Right. We do have that for the photon. So we have quantum photonics or quantum waves, you know, that when the photon uh, takes over, uh, photons aren't, you know, really important to you on your transistor radio, you know, to get some signal um, or, or on your cell phone, those are just radio waves, they're not quanta, they're not detecting individual photons. Uh, and so too, LIGO didn't detect individual gravitons, it detected the long wavelength version of the, uh, of, of the metric of the of the fabric of space time being mm -hmm. rippled by the presence of a massive gravitational encounter between in the original detection two enormous black holes which is incredible uh, which i is mean incredible. that in itself is incredible if people don't know about the ligo experiment please google it because it's it's yeah well crazy. i have like two or three interviews with the nobel laureates uh, on my channel dr brian keating oh yeah podcast into the impossible so yeah check those out um they're in my nobel minds i've interviewed uh, 11 nobel prize winners to date Oh wow! Um, and uh, including everyone who's recently won a, uh, a Nobel Prize for black holes, essentially. So that's awesome. I'm going to check yeah, that out. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we don't understand if there is a quantum particle that plays the role of the photon for gravity, uh, as the photon does for electromagnetic waves. Mm. And this this concept of you know going back into the quantum for a second, this you know in my simple understanding of quantum physics there's you know these waves of probability that exist all around us and that wave of probability collapses into a single point and that becomes you know the the you know the atom in a measurable position this this concept of the gravitational wave that we detected at ligo just basically um, further proved einstein's theory of space time and the way the space time works more than actually gave us insight because you know i was looking through your channel and you had mentioned something in one of your videos um that the most important thing to understand about the um the standard model with each of the bosons and each of the uh particles that, you know that are present there are its weight or you know that 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 there's that there's very specific data about those particles that make them unique and yeah. and we have predictions over what the graviton data is, and we can use it in mathematics to create, um, um, uh, you know, uh, guesses. Um, but we don't really know for sure what it is, right? And that's where right. string theory kind of comes into play yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, string theory is a candidate theory that could uh, be essentially a unification theory that would unify the laws of um, gravity with the quantum mechanical laws of particles, forces, and fields. So every, every force in the universe, we believe, has a, has a particle that uh, is associated with it at the quantum level. Mm -hmm. And currently, we don't have a quantum th theory of gravity that's self-consistent, that works in, um, you know, does avoid certain issues and challenges that make it mathematically uh, tenable. And so uh, string theory is perhaps the most uh, popular and some consider to be the most likely candidate for such a theory. But we're very early in the game. And, you know, some people call it like the math uh, is math of the 22nd century that right. accidentally fell into the 20th century. And, yeah. And, that, and like, you know, when, when I spoke with with folks like Brian Green, who who turned me on to string theory when I was just, a you know, a kid, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the problem with string theory that he struggles with himself is that it's very difficult to disprove, you know, that, that, right. that, you know, that, that the, the energy levels of, 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 you know, the energy levels that you would need to create the experiments to even look at that kind of stuff is so big that it's like inconceivable. But do you think, um, 
so is it is it a known thing? I guess what I'm trying to drive at is these these measurable constants that you say are so important to understanding the particles in the standard model when it comes to gravity, which is one of the four fundamental forces that supposedly is is indivisible, you know, to your point, that that math doesn't really work at the quantum level, hence why the string theorists believe that when it gets that small, it actually travels to other dimensions. And, and the the weight of it, if that's even an appropriate term, dissipates and is, you know, you can't measure it at that level of scale. Some people do um, hypothesize that um, gravity is weak, uh, weakest of all those four forces, because it, uh, it, it actually is traveling and dissipating through another dimension, effectively. Right. And, um, and because of that, I think, you know, it's still very speculative. But to get back to what you said at the beginning of that last question, yeah. you know, part of the problem is that you can't really do an experiment. Like right. even LIGO, it is an apparatus, but it didn't do an experiment. What's an experiment? An experiment is I say this uh, cube of uh, pure diamond, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, will drop at the same rate as uh, as this uh, you know, puppet of Albert Einstein. Right, which uh, we know will, is true. It will fall at the same rate. Now, that's what Galileo observed in uh, the early 1600s, and that's what's called uh, the equivalence principle, and uh, that the, these objects will fall at the same rate no matter what. Yeah. Um, and, and it doesn't depend on their weight, how fast they accelerate. Right. Um, the force to move them does depend on their mass, which is different than their weight, but not uh, getting into that right now. So, um, and that had been believed to be the case for 2,000 years. In other words, Galileo upset the authority of Aristotle and, and Socrates and all the scientists that came before him. So but that was just never even tested. So how did they test it? Well, ap apocryphally, perhaps, he went to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, dropped a bowling ball, you know, dropped a feather, and they came down and they hit the ground at the same exact instant to within his measurement uncertainty. So what did that show? He had some hypothesis, some theory that they should fall at the same rate. He devised tests. He looked for limitations in those tests. Now, how do you do that with a black hole? Right. How do you say, like, oh, well, this holds for black holes, but maybe it doesn't hold for neutron stars. Or maybe it doesn't hold in the case of, uh, of radio wavelength detection. Mm. And how do we synthesize and build a consensus around this? So it's very difficult yeah. to do these types of, let alone at the quantum level. You know, where you'd have to get to presumably a singularity, you know, an infinite amount of energy in a finite space. It's inconceivable, maybe even impossible in principle to do such an experiment, which could then be falsified in the language of Karl Popper, the eminent philosopher who came with the criterion that said that an experiment is or something is part of science if it can be proven wrong, not proven right. In other words, astrology you know, it's very flexible and you can say, you know, any time, any day, oh, I'm a Capricorn. They'll tell you what your horoscope is. And then I, I once did this and they said, oh, actually, no, I forgot. I'm a, I'm a Virgo. Uh, oh, the same <laughs> things are going to happen to you. Don't, don't worry. Right. Yeah. So it's like, it's completely not falsifiable. Um, sure. And uh, so Karl Popper, the Austrian philosopher came up with this dictum that if you could falsify it, prove it wrong, then it could be signed. Now, of course, you know, you could make it such that, you know, when Mercury is in the house of, of Aquarius, you know, have, you know, whatever, and then you could construct some test and therefore it could be proven wrong. And therefore you could say it's science all the same. So it's not a perfect rule. There is no perfect rule to say what is scientific, even what is the scientific method. So uh, but it's especially challenging in astronomy because we can't even do an experiment, period. And like, like chemistry, you could do an experiment. Physics, you can smash together you know, at the Large Hadron Collider, you know, uh, different different um, protons with other protons. You can do that a trillion times a second, which they do. But mm -hmm. how do you smash together a trillion, you know, black holes together on command? Where you can't even make them. Uh, yeah. So astronomy is very challenging, uh, even of itself. And astronomy is the study of stars and, you know, typically the local, but cosmology is the study of the universe. So while there's billion, 100 billion stars in our own galaxy, which is 100 incredible. billion more galaxies in the universe, uni verse means one verse, one thing, and there's only one. So you can't even do multiple observations because you only get one thing to observe. So it's extremely challenging to do what we do. Yeah, I am. Um, I am. Um... 
I had the pleasure of interviewing um, Neil deGrasse Tyson once, and uh, he told me something that's always stuck with me, which is that we've never really found anything in the universe that's just one. You know, so why is it that the universe is just one? You know, and, and yeah, like some people say that, yeah. Also, you know, but we've also never seen something in the universe that's infinite, right? Um, we've never seen something that's zero, right? So, it, like, what is zero? What is one? What is infinity? Um, and yet, those are all concepts that that the human mind can play with. This gets back to the, where we started, the metaverse, right? So, the metaverse is this instantiation of human beings and experiences, emotions, and so forth in a digital universe, uh, like a universe, but it's, it's a meta, it's a kind of superseding the universe in a certain sense. Um, so for all those reasons, how do we actually, um, and, you know, disprove that? Mm -hmm. And it comes out to be quite hard. But one thing that humans can do that computers cannot do is, uh, is process the number infinity. We can't calculate it, you know, we, but a computer doesn't have a number infinity. It, it can't handle you know, what, what happens when you uh, divide one by zero? Uh, it will just give you an error. Um, and there's right. they could approximate, you could approximate and say, what happens when you divide one by one over point zero, 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 and it can give you an answer. Right, right. But it gets meaningless when you come up with a, uh, an, an actual infinite quantity. There is no such thing right. in the physical universe that is infinite. Yeah, which, which, um, which, which kind of leads me to one of my, you know, again, I'm uneducated when it comes to this stuff. I went to film school and I minored in art history. So th th this is completely out of my realm. But once I learned about the experiments that happened just outside New York in New Jersey um, around the cosmic background radiation and that the cosmic background radiation is the outer edge of the Big Bang and that they can trace that back to being around 13.6 billion years old in terms right. of the light that's you know radiating out there, then I'm like, well, okay, then that's pretty good evidence if you take the leap of faith that that stuff is true, that the universe does have a finite size because we know what the outer edge looks like. So when you say that the universe is infinite, um, do you literally mean that it's infinite in terms of what you're? Oh, no, I, well, first of all, I didn't say it was infinite. Um, okay, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, what, what, I, what I did say is uh, that the concept of infinity is not manifest anywhere in the physical universe. There's no place that has infinite temperature. And there's no place that has right. infinite mass. There's nothing that has infinite uh, volume. Uh, I see what you're saying. Even the universe, we believe, is finite in volume and finite in space. Now, there may be other universes. And what's called not a metaverse, but a multiverse. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another wild kind of speculation in physics that we don't really have evidence for. But but some people su suggest does come from from well justified predictions. And some say just like Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, why should you be prejudiced to believe there's multiple universes? Uh, or, I mean, one universe over uh, multiple universes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for these reasons, I, I think it is, uh, you know, it's quite it's quite likely that uh, that we'll go for a long time without actually understanding the limits of infinity. And, you know, more than what we can do on, with the human brain, which is a type of supercomputer that mm -hmm. operates um, not infinitely fast. It operates about the speed, uh, does, you know, something like 10,000 uh, um, trillion calculations per second. Wow. The equivalent of that, which sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, but there are computers on Earth that are within a factor of two of that. Right. And certainly, right. you know, a, a salamander brain is trivial compared to us, and there are many computers that can do that. Probably your iPhone could simulate it. Um, so, for these reasons, you know, this this notion of infinity continues to guile, you know, the imagination. And as I said, I was on Lex Friedman's podcast, and he mm -hmm. he mentioned he made the same kind of you know statement about you know infinity. And I said, you know, of course, what what my uh, sock puppet friend Albert said, he <laughs> said, there's only two things in the universe that are infinite, uh, the universe itself and human stupidity. Right. And then he said, but I'm not sure about the universe. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. 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 No, no, that's that's yeah. You know, and for me, it kind of ties into a little bit, um, you know, Einstein is actually the reason why I think that you know, even speaking with Avi Loeb about Oumuamua and his theory that it could be, um, you know, alien technology, which which is, you know, fascinating. And, you know, I think 
you know, plausible for sure. For me, where I struggle with it is that I actually, because of Einstein's kind of, you know, speed limit that he set on the universe, you know, that there is this barrier um, that is light, you know, and, and like nothing can travel faster than light. And we haven't been able to measure anything that does, right? I mean, there's, there's quantum entanglement, which people say does travel faster than light, but not really, you know, like that, that's like another thing. Right. Um, gravity travels at the same exact speed. It's not faster. It's not slower. Um, that for something to make the journey from there to here, it is just such a, it's just such a pain in the ass journey that like we might be stuck with this idea that we'll be alone because that's just the way that the universe physically was set up, you know, that there's really not much we can do about it. So we best make the best of it here because this idea of, you know, uh, colonizing other planets and putting people in a spaceship with a solar sail and getting to like X percentage of the speed of light, you're still not going to get anywhere, you know, like it, it, it's, it's, it's a big place and we're kind of, you know, so anyway, that, that's kind of my cynicism against the alien thing. It's not that I don't believe that there's aliens out there. I absolutely believe that life has evolved in other, you know, places in the universe. If they can figure out how to get here, they would have broken the speed limit that we all have to abide by, which is the, you know, the speed of light. And I always think, well, the only hope is a deeper understanding of gravity. You know, that somehow gravity is the key that unlocks everything. Yeah. That's why I hold on to this romantic notion that if we were to discover the graviton particles, just like when, um, you know, um, uh, you know, Isaac Newton gave a little bit of insight into gravity. We had the Industrial Revolution. Your buddy, the sock pu puppet, optimized that just a little bit. We get we get the atomic revolution. If we can optimize that even more, God knows what we can get. You know, right. that, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's tempting to say that, um, you know, I can't say that it's anything, you know, with due respect to you, but I can't say it's anything more than wish fulfillment at this point. You know, a lot of right, people right. wish that there be aliens. There's a lot of people that believe that aliens exist without any evidence for them. Uh, I had a vigorous debate uh, with a top chemist in the UK who would be a great guest on your show named Professor Lee Cronin. Mm. He's like their, you know, down. world, like the Queen's chemist. <laughs> you know, he makes all of her prescriptions or something in Scotland. And oh, uh, we had debate on on another YouTube channel that is more focused on aliens and UAPs and UFOs, which you know, I, I've delved into. I've had people like uh, like Tom DeLong, and I've had on people like Eric Weinstein and others to debate mm -hmm. back and forth. Skeptic and Mick West, who's a fellow video game designer, probably that you know. Um, and we've debated it uh, back and forth, always with, you know, discretion and, and comedy and a little comedy. Uh, but we ended up um, having, you know, kind of coming to a conclusion with this Lee Cronin professor that there's no evidence that even a slime mold exists on other planets in our sure. solar system, let alone in other solar systems. And you'd expect that there'd be a lot of life in our solar system. Um, just based on the odds. And if you don't find life in our solar system, besides on the Earth, then I think there's almost no hope of detecting it elsewhere in the universe. And the reason is basically this little guy right here, which is a, uh, a chunk of an asteroid that oh, crashed. Cool. It's not focusing. So this is a chunk of an asteroid. I don't know. My, my YouTube. That's song. iron, huh? Uh, it's iron. It's nickel. Why won't it's it, well, here? Come on. I can study there the goes. universe, but I can't get it to focus. On a, <laughs> there it goes. There, there it goes. There there it goes. There. So this is a chunk of iron. Yes, it's a chunk of iron. It has nickel in it. It's highly magnetic. It'll stick to this giant magnet that I have here. Oh, and I love support that. its whole weight. It weighs, you know, half an ounce or something. So it's pretty powerful. Now, this little guy got here and landed in Argentina, probably 1500s or something like that. And uh, we know it comes in space because we can cut it open. We can see the crystals inside. Those only form in zero gravitational field, like in outer space. We know it came from space. Uh, and it doesn't have any, you know, bacteria or anything on it. Um, and so it pummeled into, uh, into Earth. And at UCSD in my laboratory, I have a little chunk of the moon. And I even mm. have a little chunk of Mars. Oh, and wow. That, yeah. So oh, I got to go well, there. I got to go see that. Like, you know, yeah, you know I can look up and see, a, you know. 
Yeah, we'll do an in-person podcast. Yeah, so now, yeah. how did that get there? Well, I got it through the United you know, Postal Service, uh, but uh, but they got it from a collection after this, this fragment of the planet Mars crashed into Earth. And it crashed into Earth, um, you know, only about 15 or 20 years ago. And they studied oh, wow. its composition. It identically matches the composition of the surface of Mars. It's like one gram. And that one gram, you know, it's, it's you know, hundreds of times less massive than this. It costs 10 times as much as this. Sure. Uh, and that's because it's extremely rare. But it does happen. Look, that happened within, you know, the lifetime of, of some of my kids, right? So it's not like it happened billions of years ago. Right. And so when you look at it, you think, well, if stuff can get from Mars to Earth, then stuff could get from Earth to Mars, right? Mm. And maybe it could get from, from Earth to Enceladus or to Titan, these moons of the giant gas planets, sure. which are thought to have atmospheric temperatures and pressures and maybe even liquid water and, and things like that on some of these objects. And so that's a, um, that's a possibility that life could leave Earth and get to the other planets. And yet we have no evidence of that. That hypothesis, can I, can I curse on this channel? If yeah, I'm you can curse. All right, I'm going to say what I really, no, no, it's not a curse. It's called panspermia. Oh, so panspermia. Yeah, panspermia. that's fine. Yeah, I like yeah, 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 which is a very accepted theory and one that I actually buy into. Yeah. So, of course, and, and, it's, and it's, it's brilliant that you know about it. Um, it's not accepted, but it is a way of, of constructing life on Earth. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't construct life originating itself though right it's it's a way for life to get established on earth so it's fine some people take it seriously it's coined by fred hoyle who's the same guy who popularized who came up with the name the big bang but oh, he came up with it as a pejorative as an insult to the theory he was a steady state theorist believe the universe always existed went to his right. grave believing that and uh, he was colleagues with one of my colleagues here at uc san diego uh, who went to his grave believing it too and i've interviewed people on my podcast who still believe that they were uh the big bang is wrong but anyway getting back to panspermia uh panspermia would hypothesize that life got started on earth via an impact of a meteor that preserved the either RNA or DNA or mm -hmm. tippy data. I don't know. It preserves something. <laughs> right. And, uh, and that, and that material then seeded and established life on earth 4.1 billion years ago, you know, which is only half a billion years uh, younger than the earth itself. Right. So for these reasons, I then invert the argument and say, well, if life can get here, why can't life here get there? And yet we don't see life anywhere else. Now, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence or you know sort of the like we don't have the evidence yet we haven't been everywhere but again to falsify something doesn't necessarily mean it's logically practical to do it in other words i could tell you mark uh there is on the planet uh, saturn's moon enceladus on its north pole there is a purple unicorn now can you mm -hmm. falsify that claim mark not you personally can it be falsified in principle um, no, because you have, you know, how, like, how are you going to create, you know, the evidence against it, right? You have to literally have the technology to photograph the North Pole and like, you know, did you miss it? What's the size? But, but like, in principle, it's falsified. You're, you're right. But it's in principle, it's falsifiable because Elon Musk could say, screw freaking going to Mars. I want to go to Enceladus with a purple unicorn. And right, he'd spend, right. you know, or NASA could spend <laughs> a trillion, you know, Mar Musk is worth half a trillion bucks. He could do it right, in, right. In, in, you know, a couple of years. So it could be falsified. Right. But if, what if I don't find it? Well, then I could say, or what if he, Musk doesn't find it? Um, I'm not likely going to say, oh, you know, uh, I was wrong. I'm going to say, no, no, no. He, he moved away. You know, the purple. Anyway, what I'm saying is because you can't falsify it now, it doesn't rule it out, but it's not great for it either. It's not right. like evidence supporting it. So now we have this conjecture that life can get to Earth. Well, why can't life from Earth get elsewhere? And I feel like that is neglected. People don't really think about these things. Um, as much as they should, as an argument of why there is probably not life in the universe other than the Earth, but people really want to believe it. Yeah, no, you know, one one other. First of all, it's very, it's actually quite um, uh, cool to hear you say that because I, you know, obviously I understand the logic of why there's, you know, people believe that there's many, 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 many forms of life out there, and I get that. Um, but I'm actually of the opinion that we could potentially, as much as we don't want to accept it, that we could potentially be the most advanced form of it. Yeah. Um, because if you look at the scale of the universe, as far as we understand it, going back to the cosmic radiation, 13.6 billion years old, the Earth itself, like you just said, is around 4 billion years old. That's what, 15, 16, 20, almost 20% of the entire existence of the universe, right? So we're an old planet, even though yeah. I know that we're not the oldest planet, but we're, we're a fairly ancient piece of rock. Right. Um, and 
it you know 3.5 uh you know billion years the earth was around before this rna dna mutation thing happened and then it took then it took so long for there to be the uh, first single cell and then look life does become um uh kind of uh you know what's the word i'm looking for exponential like the complexity of life is quite fascinating from an exponential perspective because from the single cell um it took the single cell a long time to become a multi-cell organism but once it did it just explodes it's like bitcoin it just goes straight up um and before you know it you know we're talking about sending people to search for unicorns on uh, 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 you know on enceladus um but I actually believe that it's possible that we could be, you know, one of the most advanced, you know, races out there. Yeah, it absolutely could be. There's no reason, uh, uh, you know, that there's anything precluding it. And in fact, I would say the evidence is kind of deafening that we're alone. We call it uh, Professor Paul Davies and Arizona State past guest on my podcast, Into the Impossible, yeah. YouTube channel, Dr. Brian Keating. He talks about what he calls the eerie silence. Mm -hmm. How come we haven't heard anybody? We've had this technology for years. Um, how come we haven't had any evidence for it in 60 years of searching for extraterrestrial intelligence? Now, they'll say we've only searched a small volume. But, you know, life is, is abundant. Life is ubiquitous, right? right. There are so-called extremophiles. You know, so once life gets started anywhere, so the combination of, of panspermia uh, with, uh, with this notion of extremophiles means that, that it's quite unlikely that life, you know, shouldn't have gotten started anywhere else on Earth. And if you just do the analysis, simulate a universe, getting back to our first topic mm -hmm. right before I have to leave uh, in this conversation, simulating things like the metaverse, simulating a universe, we do it all the time now. Um, and that most of those universes should experience Darwinian evolution of a panspermic transfer of DNA to other planets in our solar system alone, maybe even in the universe, but don't see any evidence for it. Yeah. So look, as our final topic, because I know you got to go, we, you know, we got less than a few minutes here. Um, just, just as a closing thought, because I think it's such a beautiful and important thing for me to personally take away. How do you personally consolidate all of this knowledge of the physical reality of you know mathematics and chemistry and biology with this idea of god you know how do you put those two things together in your personal life yeah so um what one thing you said earlier was not quite correct uh, and that uh, i am a practicing jew not a practicing oh. catholic i was an altar boy in the catholic church and for more on why that is, you can refer to my book, Losing the Nobel Prize. It's kind of a memoir about... Oh, okay. I'm uh, sorry yeah. about that. I, no, no, no. I, it's I, fine. It's fine. It's, uh, you know, I have the last name Keating, which is not a Jewish name. It's an Irish Catholic name. But anyway... Because uh, I thought so you converted. I thought you converted to Catholicism. I did. Yes. Oh, you did. And you went back. Then I went back to Judaism. Oh, okay. Gotcha. 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 Cool. Cool. So it's a, it's a, it's a tangled web. But I'm going to be I'm talking I'm a Catholic, a but I have been bar mitzvahed. I actually got bar mitzvahed at the Wailing Wall. Oh, you did? Wow. That's better yeah. than me. I never had a bar mitzvah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, That's I, amazing. I, yeah. I actually I'm talking with a friend of mine, Antonio Garcia Martinez, in a few minutes oh, he, for his he podcast. Might... He, he converted from uh, from Catholicism to being a Jew. <laughs> so Antonio and I went to high school together. No way. Oh, I'm going to talk to him about. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let him know oh, that okay. Mark Fernandez right. said hello. Yeah, yeah. Tony and I went to high school together and Tony was famous in high school, not only because he was the smartest guy in the school and everybody knew it, but because he was the single atheist. Because yes. we went to a Jesuit, uh, you know, high school here here in Miami, and he was the one that was on the fringe who stood up and said he was atheist. But anyway, that's right. <laughs> Antonio is great. Tony, again, say hello. Yeah. He's yeah. learned Hebrew and everything. Yes, also right, right, right. Love, uh, right, 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 right. Because because he converted into Judaism. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, he's yeah. kind of the anti version of me. Uh, right. And he was also a physicist too. He went to UC Berkeley for his PhD program, but he dropped out to be one of the early Facebook employees. But anyway, yes. You asked me about God. So um, I like to think of things as not proof. Look, if there is proof of God's existence, then would you get any plaudits or, or you know, any uh, any accolades for believing in God? I don't believe in gravity. Mm -hmm. I have evidence for gravity. Right. Sure. So it's by necessity something that's unknowable, perhaps. So that's why I call myself a practicing agnostic. Agnostic right. means not knowable, not not existing, which is what atheism means. Yeah. So when I think about what I do, I want to distinguish myself from someone who is an atheist and distinguish someone who is a theist, meaning 
I want to do something in between the two of them in a certain sense. So uh, that means for me, I go to a temple in, in San Diego, mm -hmm. um, unlike, say, Richard Dawkins, who doesn't go to any church, any temple or anything. So he's an atheist. But most people that say they're agnostic also don't go to any church or temple. They just don't right. do anything. And they call them. So I want to be practicing. I want to do some form of practice. I believe in behaviorism. The actions that you perform influence the way that you think, which influences your feelings, thoughts and emotions. Um, so from my perspective, I want to act as if the God could exist. And, and look, if people can publish best-selling books on the simulation and the metaverse being real, <laughs> I can certainly say that there's at least permission. And even Dawkins admits there's zero. You can't say there's zero chance that God exists. You can just sure. say it's not very likely. So why not behave as if God exists? And not think about believing in God, but thinking about, um, you know, whether God believes in you, so to speak. So acting right. in a certain way, if God exists, that would be commensurate with it. And then if worse comes to worse, you, you've done all the things that make life worth living in terms of, you know, having a family, being an honest person, obeying the Ten Commandments, giving charity, um, considering your deeds and, and your works, et cetera, et cetera. So from those perspectives, I view uh, the possibility of God being enough to. Uh, and maybe even outweighing the possibility of alien life, alien intelligent life, and certainly the simulated hypothesis, the, the metaverse hypothesis on steroids. Um, and so why not behave that way? And that's what I'm looking mm -hmm. forward to. And with I, that, that. I have to go and meet Antonio. But yeah, I'll yeah. send your love, Mark. It's, it's oh, fascinating. Oh, please do, man. Please do, uh, man. We got to do a part two someday. Oh, we'll definitely do a part two. The book is Losing the Nobel Prize. This is Dr. Brian Keaton. You want to say your YouTube channel one more time? Yeah, it's Dr. Brian Keating uh, on YouTube and podcast called Into the Impossible. I'll send you some links. And uh, the best way to really help me out and kind of participate, I don't have any you know, NFTs to sell or just join my mailing list. Yeah. And I send out an email every two weeks uh, called my Monday Magic Message. And that's just kind of cool stuff about science, life, philosophy, uh, it's no politics. I hate politics. Uh, so I keep that out of it. I'll put a link. You, maybe you can include that in the show notes. Will do. Will do. Thank you so much, Dr. Keaton. You uh, have it's a been great awesome, day, Mark. And we'll Pleasure talk to meet soon. you, man. Keep up bye the bye. great work. I, you're an inspiration for smaller channels like me. All right. Cheers. All right, brother.